Welcome to the UK PT's podcast, where we delve into the world of personal training one episode at a time. Here are your hosts, Joshua Mullen and Mark Laws. Okay, so Simon Herbert, we are about to enroll you into the 27 Club. So it's quick fire, three rounds, each with nine questions. I am going to set my stopwatch just in case you waffle on, because I know you have a tendency to do so. So the first round is based loosely on your education. Okay, so are you ready? Let's go. We are rolling. Question one, in what year did you qualify as a personal trainer? 2011. 12. And who was the education provider? Audiologic in Lancashire. How long did it take you to qualify from start to finish? Around about six months, I think. Not long. What was the last bit of CPD that you completed? Oh, I, well, I was part of the IFBA, so we were doing courses through them last year. I'm still studying through the ISSN with their new nutrition course so still active actively learning okay that leads on to my next question what is the next bit of cpd that you've got your eye on once i've done this postgraduate i'm going to look to do a master's i think in what topic the, in the ISSN, in ISSN. the sports nutrition yeah cool uh what is the highest well, it's, it's level... now called sorry it's now called the iopn so. oh okay cool what is the highest level of education or qualification that you currently possess? Diplomas. Uh, should a personal trainer ever be reassessed? And if so, how often? Good question. Um, I don't think you'll learn anything substantial on your, on your PT courses. So, yeah, I think regular assessment, mainly, probably yearly, um, with some sort of direction in other courses to continue education. So yeah, continuing education is important, I would say. Damn right. Uh, what skill did you gain on your PT course that you use most often today? Uh, probably using my original certificates folder as a door wedge. <laughs> <laughs> on a scale of one to 10, how good are you at your job? Without being big headed, I am amazing at what I do. Nobody can do what I do as good as I can do myself. Really? So what, six and a half? Yeah, 12. 12, <laughs> 12 mate. 12 out of 10. Jesus Christ. We change lives. We don't mess about. Cool. Well, that's all right. We, we were over two minutes there, but I think it was worth it. Um, okay. Round two is based on um, industry, um, industry preferences, let's call it. Uh, you good to go? Yes. So, first question, please name the most underrated person, product, or thing in the industry. Person, product, or thing. Wow, that's got to be hard. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Most underrated. Underrated. There's a lot of things, I think. A Go lot on, of people. A couple of them. All right. So, in terms of people, I'd say Emma Story Gordon. She's really good in what she does. I like Emma. Uh, Dan John, he's really good. Been to many of his seminars. Uh, Phil Learney has got a good calibre of the way that he brings across the education, um, but he's pretty well known, so I want to say he's un underrated. In terms of approaches, I think, I don't know. It's a good question. I'm stuck on that one. Other than that, we can we can come back to it in the in the interview section. Um, question two: Please name the most overrated person, product, or thing. You know what I'm going to say here, don't you? No, and it's a product. Say it. And it's a product. Herbalife, pyramid scales, <laughs> money making schemes that wreck people's lives and bank accounts. Big peeve. Good answer. Um, what book should all personal trainers read? Um, the Art of Masturbation and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Nice. <laughs> Maybe uh, not the first one. 
<laughs> foam rolling, yes or no? Ah, oh, it depends. Depends. Um, not too much of it, maybe every now and again, but yeah. For how long did you do gym hours before you were exclusive as a personal trainer? Ask me that one again. How long did you do gym hours for? So like as a gym instructor before you were full time as a, as a PT, so only doing PT sessions? Uh, probably for six months to a six year. Months. Yeah, cool. running boot camps. What common myth do you wish that you could debunk forever? Um, Fitness you myth, to, I, I should add. You, that you have to clean eat. Yeah. So uh, the old school bodybuilding diet, chicken, broccoli and rice. That's got to go. What is the best piece of work-related advice that you've been given? Understand the people that you're working with, their pain points, and how you can fix those pain points. Nice. Um, question A, who would be the ultimate fitness industry podcast guest? The Rock. The Rock. Someone else said The Rock as well. Um, He's a legend. Finally, what are your three favourite exercises? Um, reverse cowgirl, missionary, <laughs> and 69. Well, what does that 69 one go like with? Is that with dumbbells? Uh, let me just turn my screen upside down one second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would say probably snatch, multi-compound movements. I like it. I like a good burpee. I've even bought the registration burpee. <laughs> Have it. We'll talk. We'll talk about that another day. Um, but yes, so uh, squats. I like a good squat pattern. Like a good snatch pattern. Yeah, and uh, probably a, a split squat as well. As well. But the hell, you got a lot of squats in there. A lot of lower body, mate. A lot of lower body. We've got some upper body going off. We need some legs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Round three, and the time has gone way over, but who gives a shit? No one's, uh, it's our show. We can do what we want, can't we? Okay. Um, round three, are you ready? Go. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Favourite city that you've ever visited? Sheffield. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. If you could attend any concert, Dead or alive, who would be playing? Oh, wow. Queen. Queen, nice. Um, what was the last television series that you watched or streamed an episode of? Lupin. What? Lupin, currently watching it on Netflix. Can't just make shit up. The Master of Disguise and Robbery. Mm. Cool. Um, it's new. If you could choose anybody to play you in a movie about your life, who would it be? Jason Statham. Nice. Tea or coffee, how do you take it? Coffee. And I take it through my mouth. <laughs> um, if I could give you the power of time travel, would you rather go back to speak to your ancestors or forwards to speak to your descendants? backwards story of your life yes um, question eight would you rather shag a goat and nobody will ever find out about it or not shag the goat but everybody will think that you did can i shag it and let everybody know you you can if you want yeah you can like stick it on tiktok or something i'm going for that one go for that one nice more the merrier um, and finally, please tell us one thing that is still on your bucket list, other than goat shagging. Um, sheep shagging and Maldives. I'd like to go to the Maldives. Maldives. Nice. Beautiful. Well, there we have it. Simon Herbert, you are now a member of the 27 Club. And there is a T-shirt coming your way to... Um, to reward you for participation. Nice. As long as it's got no goats on it.
It will, well, actually, I might, I might, um, I might stick a goat on the back. Now you've, uh, now you've let us into your little dirty secret. I'm hoping it's merino wool. Oh, mate, it's cheap, nasty cotton. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to use it as like a dishcloth or something. As long as it's better than that pink shirt you tricked me into wearing. Hey, 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 hey. Don't go telling everybody my little secrets, what I make you wear when we go for dirty weekends away. <laughs> um, right, mate. Lead into, into like the interview section and just... Obviously, with this is the first show we've done, um, first show we've done since Christmas, and there's been uh, another lockdown forced upon us nationwide. So, whereas just the other side of Christmas, we had people in different parts of the countries that that were able to do certain parts of the job. Now, pretty much everything's been brought to a stop, other than I do believe one-to-one -one PT in a public space in a park or something like that. But for the most part, most of us are doing fuck all in terms of face-to-face -face stuff. So just let us know, fill us in on how that's affected you and your venue, your clients, and what everybody at your end is, is doing for their exercise. So I think we'll look at this as a two-pronged approach because we run heavily online and we also have a gym as well where we do face-to-face -face coaching. So in the gym, it's predominantly small group PT. Obviously, that's out at the minute for, for two reasons. One, we can't do indoor and two, we can't do outdoor small group. As you mentioned, it's more one-to-one. -one. So we've had to facilitate and change quite a lot of stuff around, especially in terms of how we deliver the coaching. So we've had to move online like most coaches have had to do. Um, luckily for us, we've well, I've coached online for many, many years. So the transition was, a, was pretty seamless. Um, we were lucky in the respect that we can move everything from where we are on the gym floor to doing an equipment loan out scheme and then provide some equipment for his clients to still be able to train at home in their front rooms or their garages and then deliver a good level and caliber of coaching to these individuals while they're at home. Um, we still... This time around, we've, we've gone for the one-to-one the -one outdoor stuff, simply because there's a few people that just cannot face being on a computer in front of a screen anymore, because this is probably, what, was this the third proper lockdown that we've been yeah. through? Uh, yeah. I think for us, it, it's the we, we've had four. So we had the main one, then we had a second stint, and then we had a few weeks before Christmas. Um, then they opened things back up where we, we were in tier four, could still coach, sorry, tier three, could still coach as normal with, within, the, within the guidelines. And then we've been it with this, 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 this other national lockdown. So I think it's wearing thin for some people, but then other people, you have conversations and they realize how important it is to still maintain momentum, still get results. And if anything, still be part of a tribe and a unit that's got these people when they're about to fall. So we're underneath them whenever they fall. Um, the most important thing that we've seen for us at this moment in time is just keeping people going, keeping a community mm. spirit, grouping as clients into groups of six in a WhatsApp group. So they set their own WhatsApp groups up and keep each other accountable. And yeah, it's working really, really well. Um, I would say that what we've done in terms of keeping the, the clients going on Zoom, bringing in the challenges, grouping clients together, and then still offering the outdoor one-to-one -one at no increased cost for his current members is, is, has been golden. And the reason for that is that, like I mentioned, some people won't adapt to online like they used to do. Um, others are loving it more than they used to do. Mm. Some are happy to stay at home and not get in a car and, and travel, saving fuel, fuel bills, saving time. It's a lot more easier from just to open the laptop whereas others are wanting to get out of the house a little bit within reason and attend a face-to-face -face session where they've got some normality in their life. So I think there's quite a lot of different pain points for people at this moment in time. People are seeing and feeling different things. And I think the main thing really is that you touch base with these, these clients, these people, and figure out what it is they want, where they're at, and how to deliver that. Hmm. Do, you, do you find, have you sort of had to adjust things like in terms of programming and let's say there's someone who's coming in doing three or four small group sessions a week and they want to be able to do 
a three times body weight deadlift or something like that. They've got like a, a, a real strength based goal. Have you had to sort of, how have you dealt with people like that psychologically and physically to sort of, cause obviously at the minute, unless you're giving them a two and 300 kilos worth of barbells to take home, you, um, how, how do you get around tweaking their expectations of what they're going to be achieving? Yeah, good question. So, uh, I think this all relies into the current climate, what the client's goals are, and what you can do to bridge that gap in between. So let's say, for example, somebody's wanting to achieve, a, a, our clients, they are strength, um, in, their strength development incorporated into their, into their training. They do want to get stronger, but they're not power lifters. So for us, it's a little bit easier to transition and keep these people motivated. So we do an equipment loan out scheme. But again, with that, there's a, it could be an every kettlebell or an every dumbbell. We're not, we're not hiring out barbells and plates and things like that because a lot of people, they haven't got squat racks. They haven't got any kind of facility to, to store the, these, these larger bars and plates. And it's just a nightmare to, to trying to build a program for one person and somebody else in terms of strength and power and development. So what we've done is we've tried to maintain a level of conditioning, increase power output, and then make sure that we're moving in different planes of movement, making sure that they're getting some form of strength working, maybe a little bit higher rep volume work, because it's really difficult to mimic five, six reps under a, under a back squat, as it is to a goblet squat with sort of 10, 15 kilo dumbbell. So we're looking at more power development stuff, pose squats, for example, uh, tempo lifts, just making sure that they're getting everything that they need just to keep ticking over until we get back in the gym, and then we can start and apply this strength loading again. Nice. With, um, so obviously you were in uh, sort of, you had the luxury of already operating an online business years before like uh, the COVID situation ca came along. So, so I imagine it would have been easier to, to shift and adapt, but how have you dealt with the clients who were adamant sort of face to face was their thing now they have to train online have you have you got any sort of tips or on how you how you've dealt with awkward customers and the reason i ask is because i see people posting comments in the ukpt group quite often that will say something along the lines of Oh, poor me. I've got no money and none of my clients want to do online training. Like none of them want to do online sessions. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think it might be a case of the way it's being framed and, and offered to the client, but I'm hoping that you might agree with me. Yeah, 100%. I think the art of being a good coach is to understand your clientele and get across what their needs are and develop a strategy to apply that. So for example, if me and you are discussing you not wanting to coach at home in your front room because you've never done Zoom before, it's a bit alien to you. You can't understand how we can coach you across the screen to the level that we could in the gym. Well, pre-COVID, we could touch people, we could manipulate and we could put you in movement patterns and we could, we could get close to you. You can't do that in the gym now anyway. So you've had to, we, you would have had to adapt on the gym floor to be able to improve your cue-ins, improve your coaching, your terminology, and the way that your voice and show these exercises. And that's relatively similar to doing that over Zoom. If you've mm. got a good coaching pattern and you can cue things in properly and you understand how that client moves and the strategies that you need to put in place to be able to move these people properly without touching them, you've already increased your level of coaching. Now, for somebody who doesn't understand how that works across the screen, you've got to reinforce what's important to this individual. If they're 20 stone and the goal is to get down to 16 stone by the end of 2021, that goal can't stop because if it stops, they're going to be 21 stone, 22 stone. And although the luxury of being under a bar or being around people within a small a close proximity within guidelines, obviously, is a luxury it's not necessarily the only thing that's going to get that person there. The delivery, the support, the accountability, the check-ins, the drive, and reaffirming what's important to this client 
is the is going to be the end goal. That person's still got goals. They still need to achieve what they need to achieve. And it's down to you as a coach to facilitate that and find that pathway for these people to still get there. Mm. Yeah, it's one of my big bugbears, and it's something that I sort of talk about quite a lot. And I try not to be, I used to be like a, a dick about it, but I try now not to be like a you. little bit. Yeah, I know. It was like, I just tried it temporarily, to see how it just felt. Just see how but, it went on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I sort of now I try to be a little bit more diplomatic with it, but I, I genuinely think, like, when you look at, we, we know fine well that a huge number of personal trainers struggle full stop even even when we can be out in the gyms and and running our business in the way we we want to most personal trainers struggle financially they struggle to get enough business and they struggle to stay in the industry longer than a year or two in certain some instances i'm sure i heard i'm sure i heard um someone say the other day that it's dropped something like seven eight nine months is now average life expectancy for for a, a personal trainer after qualifying and and the point i try to always get across is there's a massive difference between training somebody and coaching somebody and sort of 100%. training somebody the way the way i sort of frame it is it's the equivalent of almost just googling some like hardcore ab exercises and then i'm chuck that in my session and i'm gonna just like copy this workout that i've seen someone else doing and all my clients are gonna do it that's you're just making people do stuff and i think if that is your approach covid will fuck you in the ass big time because it will find you out it will catch you out and it will take all of your clients away from you because that isn't any tom dick or harry can download that same workout now now more than ever they can do it for free and they don't they don't need you to just tell them what to do what they need is a coach who can hold their hand and guide them from a to b and whenever there's an obstacle in the way just help them sidestep move back a bit and then go forwards at, at a greater pace i like what's your what's your take on that no, I fully agree, Mark. I fully agree. And the, the reason for that is that every time a client is hit with a curveball, that changes the day, it changes the week, that can push them back to not train for whatever reason. It can push the nutrition back. It can push the support back. And if you're not delivering that week, week, day by day, week by week, you're gonna, what you're going to see is these people are going to fall off the wagon. As soon as they lose that buy-in with you, that trust, that connection, they're not going to stay with you. So you've got, to, you've got to go over and above. Last year in the first lockdown, we spent close to sort of 17K in the gym to separate with more racks, more wall mounted racks, more plates, more toasters, more bars. Because before we just used to have big rigs, right? And we'd do four to one. So people would be spotting each other. You'd have two on a bar, one had, one had plate off, one had plate on, and we'd people to get in we had the first lockdown we had to invest a shitload of money to make sure that when our clients came back they were separated but still as close to home from walking out of that house into the gym into the feeling the environment that they were in before so what i'm trying to get across is that it doesn't matter whether it's monetary investment educational investment or whether you start to invest in yourself a little bit more. The thing is, it's going to be a constant investment as a coach to deliver to the people that you're trying to help. And that could be CPD courses. It could be mindset courses. It could be understanding how to deliver coaching sessions more fluidly. Whatever it is, you've got to keep adapting. You've got to keep learning. And you've got to keep providing to these clients. People come into the industry as coaches thinking that you're going to earn 30, 40 quid an hour. You're going to be able to just give everybody the same program. You can contact them once every month and you can train them once a week. And that's where things fall apart. Mm. It's not, it's not once a week. It's not, sorry, once a month check-in. It's not a program for everybody. It's not just do this. When somebody comes to you with a problem or a knee injury, it's not a case of, oh, well, we'll just do this. You know, you have to understand everything. And if you don't understand it, you outsource it. And if you have to keep outsourcing stuff, you learn it or you bring somebody on board as part of your team, you don't have to outsource things to. So that, per, that eco cycle that you built in your system in your gym 
it's providing everything you need for that individual and that client. Nice. Yeah, that, that's another topic that comes up all the time. And even just before we just before we started recording this morning, I was flicking through and there was a post again. Someone had asked something about, um, I can't, uh, with, I'll paraphrase it. It was something along the lines of, it hurts when I run. I think I've got shin splints. Anybody got any advice? And then below, every fucking Tom, Dick and Harry is chirping up with their opinion on what they think they don't know they don't know a fucking thing about the situation someone's just written some words on a screen that says my knee hurts i think i might have shin splints or something like that and now everyone thinks they're a fucking cairo physio osteo <laughs> and they've got all of the answers to this problem there's people even fucking plugging trying to sell their products in the course like oh why don't you buy my course here's a link to it and there was somebody very sensibly came came along and just said, listen, um, it sounds like you need to outsource it because th this is not within the, the remit. If it's a problem, if there's pain, outsource it to someone who knows what they're, what they're talking about. And hats off to, to that person, Paul Muir, I think it was, off the top of my head. Um, be because there's, 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 there seems to be a massive problem at the minute with the, the industry, and it, it seems to be more amplified than I've ever known it before. That's probably coinciding with how social media has kind of like exploded over, over the last sort of five years. But there seems to be a massive problem with people not understanding that they need to stay in their lane, and not even knowing what their lane is, and they think that piece of paper that says level three PT on it means they know fucking everything there is to know about the human body and all of its potential um, injuries and issues and etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah for sure um, I think uh, there's a good phrase here too many chiefs and not enough Indians and what mm. that means is that everybody thinks they know what they sh what they're doing and what everybody wants to guide people on minimal information, but nobody actually wants to sit down and do that background work and learn these processes to be able to give that information. And like you said, what Paul is, his name of Paul, right? So he's yeah. done the right thing. Like you cannot, from a Facebook post, you cannot answer what somebody needs to do. Like you don't even know if it's shin splints, it could be anything without a movement assessment, without getting on the phone to this person, without being one-to-one -one with that individual for 45 minutes and looking at the medical, the medical history, the background history. And like, how long has it been going on for? Did it happen from a leg break as a kid? Like what's happened? Are they overweight? This, there's so many different variables that would dictate the information and advice that you give. Mm -hmm. And again, that's only within the remit of certain individuals. So if you've just qualified as a PT six months ago, there's no way that you're going to know that leverage, leverage, level of education. Ten, nine, ten years I've been in the industry, like, and there's still things that I'm learning now, still investing in myself. And one of those things is trying to sit back a little bit and have a look at what I need to learn, why I need to learn it, and how that's going to benefit me and the clients. So you're constantly investing time, money, education, and that will never stop. But to answer your question, tangent, to, to just, but, you know, bolt into a post and give somebody some some bang on advice that people don't really understand is not, that's not coaching. It's like we discussed it earlier on, didn't we? This there's, there's, there's telling people to do things without prior understanding. And then there's coaching, which is mm. understanding that individual. And you have to know a lot about that individual to guide them through. This is somebody's life, it's somebody's body, it's somebody's movement patterns. You know, you, you're, working with, you're working with a lot. In, term, in terms of your capabilities as a coach, how much of it was, how much of it is learned through trial and error? How much of it have you sort of obtained from other influences? And how much of it is sort of, I don't know, put in the bracket of sort of like a natural instinct of how to to coach somebody right so we'll, we'll start with the last one so a natural instinct my natural instinct is to to listen to people listen to that individual and i'm good at that i'm also good at talking but i don't talk <laughs> over people <laughs> I, 
I didn't, I didn't want to point that out, but I'm glad you mentioned it yourself. <laughs> For someone whose special superpower is listening, you don't half fucking talk a lot. <laughs> well, I listen first. I listen first. So, yeah, we'll, I listen, I take on board, and then I, I try and apply that. So what you see in the industry a lot is people don't listen. They overtook when somebody's telling a pain point. They don't listen to that pain point, or they physically don't know how to deal with it and have a way out or an escapism for that client. So they just tell them anything to make it sound like they know what they're about. That is the, one of the worst things you can ever do as a coach. If you don't know, have the balls to stand there in front of that individual that's paying you time, investing into you and trusting you for you to say, look, do you know what? I, I'm not 100% sure. I don't know, but I'll find out for you. And if I, don't, if I can't find out for you, I'll refer you out to somebody who can. We can still work together. They'll deal with that kind, of, that side of it. We'll deal with this side of it, what we're good at. And that could be nutrition. It could be somebody who's struggling with the diet and the weight, boarding on type two because they're overweight, and you've got no nutritional knowledge whatsoever. But you're good at putting them under a bar, and you're good at coaching them, and you're good at programming. That's fine. But don't deliver the nutrition or talk to them about nutrition if you're not sure. Outsource it or learn. And mm. then outsource, learn in the meantime, and then bring parties together so you've built a bigger team. Um, what was your second question? So I've gone on a tangent again. Um, no, it, it was based. It was based on say how you learn to be a good coach and how oh, yeah. mu how much of it um, we touched on the, the natural uh, natural instinct for whatever that means. Um, so, yeah. so what were how much of it have you obtained from trial and error, and how much of it have you taken from other influences? So I wouldn't say influencers because influence is a bit of a broad term. People are yeah. educated and leaders of the industry a lot. So I've been to many seminars from sort of 2010 to end up at one of Ben Coombers to Phil Learnies to working through some of Storm's seminars, the IFBA. I've been through a lot. Body power. You know, I've been to a lot of seminars, a lot of courses, learned off a lot of people, took snippets away. Reinformed, reinforced things that I already knew, but effectively delivered a lot of time in, in, my, in learning in my own education. And then in terms of um, investment, a lot in terms of investment too. Uh, mm. Trial and error, phew, lots. Yeah. The, I think the biggest trial and error is the learning and understanding people and learning what your, where your ego takes you. Like you can be super confident that you can help people, but you've got to know when to pull back and when it's not your remit, where you should be delivering content, where you shouldn't be delivering content. And effectively you're in it for the long term, but you're in it to help people as much as you can. And I think there's a lot of trial and error in learning who you are, what you're about uh, and finding the right type of people to work with. Yeah. That, that yeah. fit your avatar. Um, I mean, if you, if, if we rewind back, 10 15 years so 15 16 years ago i i started doing the job um if we go back 10 years ago you would have been been starting and i think back then you um social media wasn't anywhere near as as prevalent as, as it was today when i first started it, it didn't it wasn't a thing it didn't even exist that's that's how old i am um but but back then I think a lot of PTs tried to be everything to everyone and they're listing, I can do fat loss, uh, performance, blah, 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 blah. Um, no matter what your goal is, I'm, I'm the man. And oh, there's another 12 PTs up on the board here and they're all saying the same thing. And I think that's probably why it took so long for the personal training industry to get a bit of traction and to get some really, really successful coaches. Whereas now, I definitely think we were in it before, but I think now this situation is going to accelerate the process of finding a niche and accepting that you don't have to try and get not every single person out there on the internet is your potential client. There's nothing wrong with saying I'm going to work with 40 year old men who have got a child end of story. And I'm just going to fucking dominate that little niche. Have you, have you found that as well? Yeah, 100%. I think the more you open yourself up to just work with anybody, the more you could crash your life efficiency in this industry 
And I've done it myself. You know, there's been times when I used to group coach uh, on a low ticket model for 49 quid a month and take 40, 50 people on and then realize that shit, I'm now working with 40 to 50 people. How am I going to deliver everything to 40 to 50 people to the level that I want to deliver it to? Because I can't, for me to do that, I'd have to charge more. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a part of the industry where you think, right, you need to survive and you need to live, right? You've got to earn. That's that we know that it's a business, but if you don't, if you're not earning, you can't pay your bills. You can't invest back into your education. You can't do the things that you need to do to become a better coach. So what you find is that people open themselves up to working with anybody mm-hmm. on a lower ticket model. And then because of that, you don't get, you end up working 70, 80 hours a week to, to, to cover the, to cover the level of coaching for, for the 40 to 50 people that you're working with, or in my case was, and then you find that some of these people are not getting all the boxes. Why? How do I fix that? How do I make sure that I don't overcome that problem again? Because you're in the industry to help people, make sure that everyone gets results. But if you're working with so many people for a low ticket model, you can't physically put into those individuals that you need to put into. So you have to then figure out what your avatar is. Are they male? Are they female? Are they both? Are they between 35 to 45? What can you offer your ideal avatar? And again, once you, once you warm in on that and you start to realize who you work best with, you can help them people. They get better results. You change more lives. Yeah. So that leads us on that leads us on sort of suppose to where we might as well talk about what you're doing now. Cause we, we spoke briefly about it before uh, and you mentioned about a specific niche that you're now sort of looking to target where you will be working with a smaller number of people, but on a, on a much more exclusive basis. Yeah. So in the gym, we, we run small group five to one. And the reason that we do that is because it's more cost effective. We can still coach these individuals on a one-to-one basis in that small group, deliver what they need from an original assessment. So we get them in, we assess these individuals, we look at where they currently are and where they need to be. We then provide a small group format that delivers the best training that they can get, right? So if you were in a commercial gym, you'd be potting around doing your own thing. So we took the one-to-one model and moved into small group and still deliver the one-to-one coaching inside that small group. So it's more cost effective for people. There's a better atmosphere in there and people get results. Then we deliver some nutrition on top of that and accountability. So we do a weekly check-in. We're providing with all the nutrition they need. We've got a membership website with videos, learning and education. That delivers everything that they need and they have a dedicated coach each week. Then we have an upset sell package, which is one-to-one online and that delivers day-to-day coaching with me but focus more on the busy professional that's struggling in all areas of their life such as you know, hitting a pit hitting a goal their pain point might be they've tried for s- s- sort of three to four years to get in shape they've done really well but there's just some more boxes that they want to tick they can't get there on their own they need day-to-day support and accountability to get them where they need to be and then that package delivers that so it's day-to-day coaching in the trenches on the phone mapping out their week looking where the pockets of time are where they can train where they can't train so you're not leaving them sort of you're not leaving them for one to four weeks to do a check-in we do the one-to-one check-in in the gym each week which works really really well but there's some people that will get to a stage of their life and their coaching that they've got a more demanding job or they've got kids or something else is going off in their life. And although that's ticked all their boxes up to that point, they need more close coaching, more accountability, more support to fast track to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So that's why I deliver that on a one-to-one method. And that is golden. It's day-to-day. So you're on the phone. You're contacting these individuals. You are mapping everything out for the 90 days, bringing them to where they need to be. So that once they've got there and they've ingrained these habits and they've got to where they want to be, They've upscaled the life, they've upscaled relationships, they've upscaled um, areas of the business. So when they're working in industries and businesses and running their own businesses or CEOs, this is upscaling this because they've got more energy, they feel better about themselves, more self-belief. 
So it's like, it's, it's looking at what you're delivering on one model and then looking to what you can deliver on another model, but retaining that individual and, and just basically taking them from where they are to where they need to be and then putting them back onto maintenance so that they can maintain that traction for however long they stay on board, which is hopefully going to be life. It's not a short-term journey. So that so you say that 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 one to one uh, end of the um, end of the um, business is online. Is that based on them doing all of their workouts at home with no equipment, or do you? Because I'm assuming some of these some of these clients won't be local to you. They'll be from fucking Timbuktu and all over the shop. So yeah, how do you how do you get around? the actual programming in terms of what they've got access to? Well, I'll give you an example. So I've got a client in Vietnam. We, he's got access to a, a small gym. There's not, it's not fully equipped, but there's dumbbells, there's some kettlebells, there's a Smith machine, there's a few pec decks and some epileptical equipment, some cardio equipment. Food out there is very different to what food is here. So things like cottage cheese, they can be, play, they can be paying something like, I don't know, 48,000 dong for cottage cheese, which is around about sort of 12 to 14 dollars. That's really expensive. So, if you start building meal plans with things like cottage cheese in it, they're not going to be able to sustain that for the long term. So, you have to do your research on that individual, what it is that they want, what their weekly schedule looks like, map all this out. And that's where the one to one level of coaching comes in. So, the programming would be based on whether they've got any equipment, whether they've got access to a gym. And at this moment in time, most people are in lockdown, right? So they can't access a gym. So have they got any equipment at home? What can you develop in terms of training to provide the best out of it so they get to where they want to be? And this is all it is. This is, this is the key thing about one-to-one -one coaching. It's an eye investment, but you can deliver everything that you need to deliver because you can put the time investment in to research it all. So I've researched supermarkets, mega markets in Vietnam, where this individual was living. I've um, researched local gyms with more equipment. I've done all that. And then I just deliver this to him. And then we check in daily. Right, mm. have you ticked your non-negotiables? Your non-negotiables today are to do this, 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 and this, and this. You're going to do that for a week. We check in morning and night. Have you ticked your non-negotiables? Yes. That is just a 100% fail safe plan so that individual gets to where they need to be and again this will change for every individual so one yeah. person is never the same as another individual work commitment family life training equipment yeah it's a, it's, they, a it's a tough task they, they they might be similar but they're always going to be different aren't they always yeah um would it be fair to say that in terms of say your your mate over uh, out in Vietnam, Vietnam. Sorry, would it be would it be fair to say that the actual the actual exercise selection or the sets and reps of of what you're asking him to do is probably a piss in the ocean compared to all of the other stuff surrounding that in terms of the like the personal care and attention to him and just making him do it just ensuring that he's got a system in place that he's going to follow 100 percent. so you can pluck a training program off google you can pull a nutrition plan off google he knows that cottage cheese is expensive in vietnam so he probably won't buy it so he knows all these things but implementing it into practice is what's difficult because there's that much confusion he doesn't know if it's right for him yeah. And not only that, when somebody's about to fall, when you're underneath it to catch them, pull them back up and guide them back on that track day by day, there's no room for error. Like one day they might have a bad day. They, you know, they might have a busy day at work, not in the macronutrients, for example, or go over macronutrients. That's cool. But if that happened for three, four, five days and then it moved into two weeks, by the time you've checked in with them, they're like, yeah, everything's fine. And you actually look into it. Maybe it's not. And you've lost a lot of time there which can create more frustration, which can affect promotions at work. It can affect family life. Hmm. When you pull it back in day by day, keep these people accountable. There's no room for error because you're on it. So if one bad day would never turn into two or three bad days, because hmm. you pull it back into line. And that's where the value is. The accountability, the support, 
just that general understanding, knowing that somebody's there to catch you every time it don't go right. And we've all had a man with business coaches. I've got two business coaches, one for the online, one for the offline, for the gym. And I know that I know what I need to do day to day, but it's sometimes good to have somebody there overlooking so that I don't make, you know, decisions on emotion, the wrong decisions, if it's not the right decision, I plan, every, they plan things out, give me some idea of what's going and where it's going. Like, you know, it's all there. So no mm. matter where you are in the industry or what you do, having a coach and somebody to deliver to you is golden. That, that's inter- interesting because I, um, I see, I see um, Anthony Park talking about this a lot from, from Pure Gym and, and he always makes me laugh when he mentions it. And he will talk about how the way that a personal trainer preaches to their clients or to potential clients, how important it is in order for you to succeed, you need to have me telling you what to do. Yet so few personal trainers are prepared or seem to be prepared to practice that themselves and invest in someone coaching them through their business. Now, I've, I've known you a long time, and I know that you do all right for yourself, um, if, we, if we put it modestly. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that you still, 10 years on, and with a very successful business with a lot of different strands to it, that in their own rights earn a good income, yet you still have not one, but two different business coaches, one for online, one for offline. Yeah, I think without that, I don't think I'd be pushing forward to where I need to be. I'd sit back, I'd get stale, I'd get dumb. I'm not saying I would, but that's potentially what could happen. Hmm. I think moving forward is important. Moving forward is important. Having that reassurance and that self-belief that you are constantly investing into your education and and your own health and your businesses to take other people, their health, their businesses and where they need to be is is a big part of doing what you do. Yeah. Uh, And it makes sense, doesn't it? Like if we're if we're gonna stand in front of 20, 30, 40, or 100 clients, whether that's face to face in a gym or when we can, or whether that is in an online free Facebook group if we're standing there saying to them, you need to have me holding you accountable to do these things at these times, and it will help you to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. It only, it makes sense for them to have somebody doing the same for them from a, from a mentoring or, or a business perspective. Doesn't it? It's, it seems ridiculous not to, not to have that. Yeah, I, I agree for that. I'll just, I'll just write that down. Mark Law's PT Mentoring uh, launches this afternoon if anybody wants to sign up. <laughs> Mark, Mark Law's Mentorship. Exactly. Guru um, Influencer. Business no, 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 no. Don't use that word. Um, mate, can you, can you give us an example of some things, and you can use that specific client in Vietnam if you like. Can you give us an example of what would be on his non-negotiables list yeah so again this will be different for each individual but what we normally do is jump on a call the first assessment call is mapping out what their week looks like so what time do they wake up what time do they go to bed have they got family have they got little boy a little girl kids running around how demanding is their job over the day where do they eat what times do they eat what do they eat and we, we look at everything over that week so, for example, on these non-negotiables, it could be that if he's working sort of 10 hours a day and he's only got two hours to see his little boy when he comes home from work, his non-negotiables is to not do anything other than get home and spend some time with his family. His training then comes after his little boy's gone to bed, right? And then we're planning that pocket of time there. Because for some people who've got a burning desire to change, they don't intentionally do things, as in push their family away, but... Mm. They want, they want to be the best person that they are. They love the family so much that they want to change, but sometimes they let other things get in the way of that. So it could be a pocket of time where you go, right, between six and seven at night, you're spending time with your family. You get home, you have tea together. Your training doesn't come until you've done that. Your training then starts at half seven, eight o'clock at night. You've got 
45 minutes there. So we're going to map your training out so that you get everything done in that 45 minutes. It's going to be fast paced, but I don't want you in gym for two hours. I want you to get back in bed. I want you to have a pre-bed routine. And I want you to be able to waking up that morning refreshed and ready to combat running three businesses and flying around, around that country that you've got to do. Because if you're not ticking them boxes, they're going to fail. It could be a step count. It could be hitting, for example, 6,000 steps normally. We might make it a priority that it hits those steps, right? And the reason for that is that we want to increase need. Not only that, we know that people feel better when they move around more. You know, sat in front of a computer or doing the same thing day in, day out. We know movement's not good. Posture, like general need, like general sense of well-being as well. So these non-negotiables could be anything, but majority of the time it'll be ticking a step count that's, that's worked out for that individual. We know that 10K is a relatively good, you know, ball, ballpark figure, but he might not have a tracking device, might leave his phone on his desk. So he could be doing 12, 14, 15,000 steps, but only getting 10,000 steps on his phone. So can we look at a way that we can get a little bit more detail in what he's doing, where he's not burning out, or we're not getting his calorie intakes wrong? Or when we look at his nutrition, do we go through portion control? Do we go through calorie intakes? Or do we just choose a reckoning chart and guide where he extracts foods that's already pre-calculated and built and he just waits them to build his own plan for the day? Like there's many things we can do. Hmm. But effectively, these non-negotiables are non-negotiables because <clears throat> they make the biggest change day to day in this person's appearance, feelings, well-being, and business life. Nice. All right. And I, hopefully there's, there's, a, there's a lot of PTs that will listen to that and they think, shit, that's a, that's a lot of work to have to put in to, to just one person. How am I going to roll that out to 20, 30, 40, 50 people? What, um, how, many, how many people do you work with on that one-to-one -one basis, if you don't mind me asking? 10 a month because of the simply because the time investment that it takes yeah. like it could be two hours in the morning checking in with them making sure that they've got set up for the day what are you planning to achieve today you know what's your all time lows what's your weight where we're looking at not only that they have a spreadsheet which is a live google spreadsheet document so this is all as they input it i can literally go into their folders google drive and see this uploading as they upload it so I can look at the weight from day to day. I can look at the nutrition intakes. I can look at everything. Anytime I want to extract some data, that client's got that data in there. So we're not making any mistakes. On a, on a one-to-one -one level, at this, at this level, it is very detailed. You couldn't probably spread this level of commitment across like larger group coaching online. But that's not necessarily to say that that's not going to deliver to certain people. That would deliver to certain people to a, to a degree. But then there's other people that need to upscale where they're currently at to push forward that could always then drop back down to this maintenance package below. Yeah. So it's being able to see when people need it, understand the difference between small group delivery and a maintenance package, and then upscaling that to one-to-one -one close support. So you can't work with a lot of people unless you start building the team out which we're currently doing and then training the staff having fulfillment coaches that check in in the morning and evening and then you know that's that's how you can grow and scale that side of the business again yeah a lot of lot of work but it's part it's part of the process yeah but but in terms of like one individual coach sort of 10 10 clients is you, you see that as sort of like the, the ceiling as it were like the to be able to deliver that level of right. of service for, for for me at the minute for the level of service that we in, include into that yeah yeah and you said 10, 10 clients you prob said probably go on yeah 10, 10 clients a month and the reason for that is that first month is very time heavy so they need you on the phone all the time. There'll be things they don't understand. As they get through, it's a 90 day package. So as they get through the 90 day packages, the checking's still a reliant. They're still yes. doing their day-to-day non-negotiables, but they understand these more. They've, there's more habits created. There's more drive to desire. That first month is super heavy. Super heavy in terms of time, commitment, building plans, rescaling things. Because as things move forward, again, 
you know, you, you have to find certain nutrition parameters for these individuals. Like mm. they'll change from month to month, from week to week. But at first, you you don't always necessarily find the right strategy. They might want to track calories. And then as you start and delve through their education and, and they're tracking, they could be just be not tracking quite closely. So you either deliver a, a coaching video or get them on a coaching call and show them how to do this properly, or you find another approach that works well until they've built that education to move into that. And it's constantly amending, implementing, learning strategies, figuring out where these individuals are going. So yeah, any more than sort of 10 to 15 people a month, you'd struggle to deliver yeah. that level of commitment. Yeah, no, that definitely sounds like it. And then, so that's that's a 90-day program, a three-month package. Do you find people then do that sort of recurring? Do they, they, they string a few of them together? Or is the idea to do one three-month block and then maybe drop down to sort of one of the lower-priced maintenance packages, as it were? Yeah, so the idea would be to scale them from where they are now like say taking Mark 1.0 to Mark 2.0, which is realistic goals that we've mapped out in 90 days. And then after that, they might have a separate goal or a shift in what they want to achieve. If the shift is there and it needs more close support, then we can run another 90 days. But there's also then the maintenance package afterwards where they can continue to gain momentum, continue pushing forward and still have that accountability and support. They just don't need as much detailing in the life, to, in the day-to-day -day strategies. They've, they've, they've created a lot of habits through those 90 days. It's essentially a fast track from where they are now, taking them to where they need to be within realistic terms, and then allowing them to be able to work together with me and maintain that moving forward. Yeah, that's cool. And obviously, when you're limiting a product like that to only 10 people, that's going to be, it's going to be quite high-end, how much do you charge them, if you don't mind me asking? It's 2400 2400 for the 90 days? 90 days. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that gives people an indication of the, the clients that are out there. There are people that are prepared to pay, that's £800 a month, that's £200 a week, give or take, um, in terms of having your hand held and your ass wiped that much by a good coach um but there'll, there'll be people who will sort of go oh, uh people don't want online coaching people can't afford to to have coaching yeah. the beauty of the internet and the the social media and and for, for for all of its flaws but the beauty of those things is that it makes it really easy for us to find the the small number of people who are prepared to invest in themselves and to invest in in a, a, a good quality coach aren't they for sure and i i have an assessment process that i don't work with everybody like i mm. try and try and wind down the avatar to make sure that when they jump on that call they are the right person but if i've got any doubts or i don't feel i can help this individual or they're not where they need to be to ready to commit i won't work with them and it's yeah. as simple as that because that could not, not only do i not get to help that person but I also then don't get the results that we want to achieve, which doesn't look good as me as a coach. Yeah. Uh, I suppose an important thing to add there is that I think that is a luxury that you earn. You earn the right to have that approach over time with experience in the industry, don't you? It'd be very difficult to qualify on a Friday and Monday morning be turning people away because you only work with a certain type of person. Because obviously at the start, when you're in the trenches, you just have to you have to um work with a wide range of people, don't you? Uh, yeah, but when you're on the gym floor, I guess that's different and you you're delivering yeah a coaching program and you're helping people get into some kind of shape. What we're talking about now is people who have trained for quite a long time and never actually got to where they want to be. Some mm. calls that I have with people, they've been suffering for 10 years trying to get to yeah. where they want to be. Dieting, drop down, gain more weight. You know, the, the general gym, day-to-day -to -day gym stuff is not, it ticks the boxes in terms of health and training, but it's not, it's not taking this person from Mark 1.0 to Mark 2.0. And that Mark 2.0 is, is a desired change to change now. And if it's yeah. left any later on in life, the ramifications could be massive. 
Sorry, mate. I had to let the dog out. She's doing my head in. Whinging exactly. at the door. But yeah, I mean, like you say, it's um, you can't you can't just do this two weeks after after getting qualified. You've got to get you've got to work with people. You've got to get that experience, and you don't start to get experience until you start to coach with people. Mm. But I think what we're trying to get to here is the attitude in how you get there and what you do to get there is what is going to give you the longevity in the industry and get you to where you need to be in terms of helping people. That's yeah. that's the key thing here, I think. You've got it, to be prepared to invest. It, it's a steep learning curve, isn't it? And and we alluded to it earlier that you, you learn through trial and error and you learn through working with hundreds, if not thousands of people and starting to pick up on their behaviour and um, learning to try and understand them almost. And something that you've mentioned a few times is about pain points, understanding the client, trying to either identify or work out what their pain points are and then being able to deal with them. What are, what are some of the most common pain points that you, you find? People are different, but I guess it all, on the surface, you've always got some weight problem. So whether they are a little bit overweight and want to, and want to get in shape or they can't fit in the clothes or they don't feel comfortable on a beach in a bikini or in shorts like they're they're like these are what we call surface level problems they are what they see but also what they feel but when you get deep rooted this weight issue that they may have you know when people are saying i don't want to go on holiday because i don't want to put a bikini on or i don't want to go on holiday with my son um or or my husband because i feel that i'm that overweight i'm going to embarrass them these you're starting to delve deeper into what people's problems are and it's although the surface level is image and how they look and getting into the clothes there's something else a lot more deep rooted going off yeah like it could be an health issue it could be scared because in their family there's been heart disease they've all all the family's been a little bit overweight for example this individual is a little bit overweight and if they don't change that now although they've been trying to change it for 25 years they're never going to change and they're always going to be on the borderline of being an alpha. And that could be a massive risk. That then affects their work because they can't concentrate at work. They don't want to go to social events when we're out of COVID because they sit in a room and don't feel that they should be there. And when they go out for a meal, they have to sit there and not enjoy the food that they want to enjoy because they're scared that somebody's going to go, you shouldn't be eating that because you're overweight. Like this. There's so many other issues going off inside people that you don't actually see unless you start and pick through it and get to the deep rooted issue. So I I suppose a a fairer question from me on this note then would be, how do you go about digging for it? Because it's very difficult if Stacy walks into the gym, it's the first time you've met her, hi, I'm Simon. What are, your, what are your problems? Like, what is it you're, you're hiding that you're not telling us? What are your real problems? What, how, what's the sort of process that you go through for, with your coaching techniques to try to uh, get them to feel comfortable enough to be honest enough about the underlying issues? So I think we need to look at this on, on two levels. So yeah. if somebody's coming into the gym for small group PT, the chances are they've been somewhere else or not done anything before. So when you get these people moving more than what they were before, get them enjoying exercise and get them into a strength training program where they're hitting all different movement planes and they're just ticking the basics in extra movement and steps and nutrition, people get results. That is sometimes enough to deliver a, a, a monstrous change in how they look and how they feel. Like, that, that could be enough. They could, do, they could maintain that for, for the rest of their life. Some people just need to get into doing something and some account and supportability in a group like we do in the gym. And that is enough for people for years and years and years. Yeah. But at some point, you've got to be aware when that individual needs a little bit more because it's so easy, whether they're online or in the gym, to look at that individual and not listen and then see that they are suffering with, with other things. And then what they can do then is get frustrated and stop all everything altogether. 
because they just go, do you know what? They hit a wall and just go, what, what is the point? What's the point of me turning up to the gym? What's the point of me training? What's the point of me doing everything else? Because I'm still feeling what I feel inside. And they won't tell you that on the surface. So this is where you have to look, right? In the gym, for example, are they in all the sessions? Do a weekly report. If they're canceling sessions all the time, something's going off. If it's work, you might have to adapt the training sessions around them a little bit better so that they can continue with some momentum. You're constantly evaluating what, what these clients are looking like, what they're feeling like, how they speak to you. It's, it, it's, it's, a constant, it's a constant job day in, day out. Online, you don't know this individual unless you actually get on a 45 minute to an hour call with them. And then you start and ask, what are these problems? Mm -hmm. How long has this been going off for? What do you feel when you look in the mirror? Oh, I feel shit. I feel like I'm embarrassed. I've got, you know, I want to get rid of my tummy. I've been trying to get rid of this for 25 years. Okay, cool. Why, what does, what does Jane 1.0 look like now? She's, she's overweight. She's not feeling right. It's, it's affecting her family and her relationships. Like it's, a, it's suffering promotion because she's not got the confidence to go and get the promotion that she deserves. Like, so what does Jane 2.0 look like? Confident, in her clothes, in a bikini in the summer and, and being able to laugh and be happy without feeling judged. Like that, that, that's, a, that's a big change. That is a massive change in somebody's life. And then it's for, if you can deliver that in 90 days and you're confident in doing that, and I am, and I do this all the time, like that means more than the actual money that they're paying. But if they don't pay the higher ticket price, they never commit. Mm -hmm. And these are the mistakes that we've made before. I've, since 2011, I, I run a boot camp for 20 people. We used to do this month in, month out. It'd be 99 quid. So two grand, used to cover all my bills, cover my overheads, cover everything. I used to get a little wage. But I'd still be working. The boot camp was only at 6 a.m. in the morning, at 6 p.m. at night, Monday to Friday, and then two hours on a Saturday. So it was like, what, 10, 12, 12 hours a week coaching. But I used to over-deliver. I used to do nutrition for these people. I had a basic level four nutrition, so I could implement certain strategies, right? But the, most of the time I was on the phone to these individuals. If they'd missed a session to boot camp, I'd be on the phone. Like, oh, everything I've always done, I've always delivered. And mm -hmm. I've never got paid any extra to over deliver, but it's always been the principles and the morals of doing what I do. And when you over deliver, which you're gonna to have to do, especially when you're new to the industry, You've got a client, you need to be on the phone, you need to be checking in with them, even if they're not paying for it. That's where the education comes from. You get to learn these people, understand them, what they're saying to you. Can you deliver something else or a little bit more training to them to help them? Can you deliver something else, a support package to help that individual that's just not getting all the boxes that they need ticking? You can't tick all the boxes for everybody on one package. And that's something that you're gonna to have to understand. People will want a package dropping down because they don't need that level of support or they'll need to go up. So having a couple of packages where you can deliver everything in an ecosystem to an individual means that there's no escapism for them. They can get what they need and you're constantly helping that individual. But it all comes down to over-delivering, getting results, showcasing that, showing how good you are at what you do, getting them on a testimonial and getting them mm -hmm. to talk about how good you are. That is where the development and the growth in the industry comes, in my opinion. Mm. Nice. No, I agree. I like that. Um, you've mentioned a few times about mm -hmm. um, get them on the phone. Do you physically mean ring them and speak to them in a voice call as opposed to just like a little WhatsApp message or a text message? <clears throat> it, depends on the, it depends on the person. So if you're checking in, it might be a voice note. Like it might be in the morning just to check in saying, hi, Jane. Right, I've got your check-ins from last night. Everything looked good yesterday. What we need to do today is just tick that box with your steps. Steps were down a little bit. We need to get your protein intake up a little bit today. Although that one day yesterday is not going to be a detriment in the long run. If we keep ticking these boxes and getting it right today, we're going to be on track. Check-in mm -hmm. at the end of the night. Have you done what you need to do? Blah, blah, blah. Yep, done it. Nice one. Proud of you. Well done for ticking it off. That's something that they wouldn't do if you wasn't on the under, other end of the phone. Yeah. When it comes to speaking to a client and seeing how they are and what the problem is. We have a weekly check-in in the gym where we send a form out, send an email out, and on that form, it now flags up. So if they've ticked a couple of boxes, it automates into a system and it will flag it up straight away saying this client needs 
dealing with straight away, right? If they've gained weight, it'll flag it up as a red flag. We'll be straight on the phone. Yeah. What's happened this week? Why is your weight gain? Boom, boom, boom. Oh, well, I've been off my diet this week. All right, cool. A little bit of a little bit of petting and a bit of hold, hand holding on that 10 minute call can be all that client needs to get back on track. But that's not the case for everybody, as we mentioned before. So you might have to get like the calls that I do for the online, I get on a video call like me and you are now, yeah. 45 minutes, and we'll go through everything, where they currently are, where they want to be, why they're at, what they're at. And if they don't open up, I try and open these people up. I'm like, look, we need to be honest. Like, what is it? I can't help you if you don't open up. Mm. And when people open up and tell you what it is the problem is, it's quite shocking sometimes what that issue is and yeah. how it needs to be fixed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely it does. Absolutely. And it's just, it's, um, I just think you, it might be a generational thing, but when, like, say, if you go back, when we were at school, you used to have to ring your mate's phone to ask if they're going to come out to play or something. Whereas now, communication has changed a lot and you can just send like an almost anonymous like message like uh, when you when you're sending a written text message it, a lot a lot of the message can actually be lost in terms of you you can't de you can't detect any tone of voice or sarcasm humor P things can be misunderstood misinterpreted and, and i think that opens up a lot of potential problems on behalf of the on behalf of the person the re, the receiver of the message this it's why you get no end of arguments in facebook forums and and stuff like that people wasting hours of their life arguing about shit when it's probably unnecessary because they just didn't understand that there was that that comment was sarcastic and if we were in a pub and we were chatting you would have laughed your fucking head off but because you're just reading it you're like hang on a minute is he fucking having a go at me here right i'll fucking show him and um i just think that's that now when we get this if we're into the, the the online coaching world is exploding it's it's increasing exponentially and i don't think it's ever going to go backwards and um as as much as i've been anti online coaching for a long long time now i'm actually a, a, an advocate I, I genuinely think it fills a really important gap and i just think it's important to understand those different types of communication and that sometimes getting on a video call like this is not quite as good as being sitting next to each other around the table but we can't do that so tough shit this is the next best thing if we don't have zoom or skype then a, a telephone call is the next best thing if you can't do that then a voice me the memo or voice message at least shows that there's a bit of a person behind the the message Does that sort of makes sense yeah, definitely. 100%. I think you've got to look at them levels of where that people need it, like you mentioned. So a video call is some, in some instances, never going to be the same as sat outside of the someday, sat at the side of someday, eye level with a cup of coffee, right? Mm. That connection's there. But for some people, it might be feel more relaxing and beneficial for them to be in the front room behind the computer because they're in their own surroundings. Yeah. So it's, I think it's understanding that there's never... There's not always a perfect scenario or situation. I think what the perfect scenario and situation is that that client feels that you're helping them and they're getting what they need. And to do that, that does mean picking up the phone every now and again, having a quick chat. It's very, you'll find some people open up just over a phone call, but mm. it's very rare. I don't do any phone calls anymore in terms of like the online strategy stuff because you just can't, you can't connect with that individual, especially if they're coming in from a cold to warmish lead and they don't really know you. They've just seen your content. They've got a real good idea that you are the person that's going to fix all their problems, but they've never spoke to you before. Mm. So I think video call an hour to relax and map stuff out and get, get deep into what it is that the problem is, is, is the, the, the best approach. If you were in the gym and you knew people, and they've got a little bit of a problem with the email and they're not sure about something, I think, sure, pick the phone up, get on the phone. Because by the time you sent an email, if it's immediate and it needs a response, you've sent an email, you might be busy, they send an email back, two days, three days later, you've still not fixed that problem. 
yeah. just take two minutes to pick that phone up and just get on the phone, fix it there and then. If it's something they just need a delivery of, like an ebook or a question around session times or something else, or should I go for a walk or fine, email back or text back, voice note. Mm. So I think it's like you said, we're old school. Like I would have had to go and knock on somebody's door to see if they were playing out when I were a kid. Yeah. I would have traveled from A to B, probably a 25 minute run or a push bike to go and knock on my mate's door to mm. find out he's not there. Or, or, you, or, you'd have to, or you'd have to have memorized his home phone number and then yeah. someone else's phone number, then someone else's. And I used to go through and ring like seven or eight mates, back, and I knew all their numbers, bam, 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 bam. Now I don't even know my own fucking mobile number. Yeah, snap. Or reverse charges when you've never got any money. <laughs> <laughs> true. Mom, can you come pick me up? Uh, I'm buying I'm... around Gary's house and he's not in. <laughs> <laughs> Doosh, doosh, doosh on phone box. Mum, fucking phone box is not working. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, I, mean, I, I, um, it's, it's a nice touch. The It's probably something that I don't do enough either when I've been working with people. Um, and I think communication in that sense is it's easy to be lazy and just to get used to I'll ping the text message. Whereas a voice memo um, or a video call or a phone call is 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 a is a is a nice touch i always remember when um probably about three or four years ago i don't you don't know if you remember dan meredith organized an event it was like the the, the best marketing event ever or whatever he called it where he had gary vaynerchuk um as the headline act down in london and i i went along i booked a ticket and within about 10 minutes of me booking my ticket i got an email back like your typical sort of confirmation email i opened it up and it was a video message from the guy who he'd set the event up with and it was to me it was like hi mark just got your booking thanks a lot looking forward to seeing you there boom done it was like a little 30 second intro message but it but he had recorded it especially for me had used my fucking name in the message and i just remember thinking there oh, that that is a just a nice touch going above and beyond because how easy is it to just automate an email thanks for your booking boom basically i couldn't give a fuck about you now i've got your 80 quid um but a, 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 the message that they sent out the video message was um it, it went down a lot better in my estimations anyway yeah yeah it's good that good touch um mate just before we move on you talked about say like your clients at the minute who are working out online, some of them have borrowed kit from home or they've got their own stuff at home. We're talking now about a much lower, a lower price um, level of service. You talked about challenges and stuff like that. How, how, do you, how do you work with challenges? Do you set something for the whole group? How do you make it possible for people of different abilities to to be able to do this, this the same thing how, how do they work so it's more of an accountability challenge and we yeah. normally do this as a bolt-on package to the current packages that we run inside the gym and the reason for that is because again you're upscaling the level of accountability and the time investment to keep people going so there's a bit more nutrition involved there's a bit more um, in terms of like accountability and on the phone and whatnot but what we've done is we've just given everybody this challenge through lockdown because for us, it's a shit situation. We don't want to charge people extra because they're not, they're already having to adapt and overcome certain life strategies. So we give this six week challenge. This six week challenge is, is called the accountability challenge or we're going to shred games, right? Some people might want to just increase a little bit of muscle mass. Um, but the majority of our clients are predominantly wanting to lose weight or maintain good body composition. Hmm. So we just run a six week challenge. We have a start date, we, we create a load of hype around it. We get them to put the photos into our booking system, which we use Kooks at the minute, which are like, um, they can book sessions through it. They have documents and folders in there. And it, it's, it's a real good system. Um, but that aside, they put the photos in, they put the starting weight in. And then what we've done this time is we've grouped them together into groups of sixes, right? So we've just, gone through his member list, randomly gone one, two, three, four, five, six, group one, one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, group two. And then we've overlooked it and seen like, right, if there's a couple of people that we feel should, like maybe these four groups, new starters group together with two people that's been here for a long time, we might group six new starters together. 
so that yeah. they're connecting, building a bond, keeping each other accountable. Then we have my zone belts inside the gym. So we have a my zone system. We run a MEPS challenge. So every one of our clients has got a my zone belt. We track their calories. We track their MEPS, which is their my zone earning points. You, you know yeah. pretty well what my zone is, but it's for those that don't, it's a heart rate strap that calculates calories and it, it sinks into the gym system so that everybody can interact with each other. And for accountability, probably one of the best things that we integrated into the gym. Yeah. We can see when we train in Monzo, and again, this is something else that we brought in. My zone does something called what's called MZ remote. So when we're coaching on our screen, we attach cables to the big TVs in the gym. So we've got three screens. We've got, uh, we can see on the, on the, on the iMac, the, the zoom call, and then we've got the my zone belts that all come up. So even though they're at home, their my zone belts are all functioning, showing people's heart rates, calorie burns and everything. So even though they're at home, like the level of coaching in the gym, if somebody's struggling a little bit or you can see that they're getting a bit hot or whatever, and the heart rate's a little bit higher, you can sense and feel all this inside the gym. When you're on a Zoom call, not as easy, but still doable. So we, we can look at the heart rates and track and still feedback. Look, Claire, you know, your heart rates at night, too, are you feeling all right? You should be around mm -hmm. about green or blue. Like, you feel all right? Let's drop that weight down a little bit. Let's adjust your rep ranges. Let's take that pose squat out. Let's yeah. take any isometric stuff out. Let's adapt it for you. And that's what we do still. Like in increase the rest period between sets or whatever All you need to do. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So tempos, rep ranges, exercises, regression, progression systems. So if somebody's under a goblet squat uh, and they're quite new, we probably won't give them goblet squat pattern for that day. We'd, if they've only done two sessions, we're going to give them body weight squat pattern. Yeah. We're not going to put them into any pose stuff because they're going to get so many, so much DOMS effect from that two, three days later that they're going to miss a session or they're not going to enjoy it. So you're constantly coaching and adapting. But in terms of the structure and the accountability, the my zone plays a massive role because again, we can see what's going off. So if people are missing sessions, and again, like I said earlier, we do a weekly risk report. So we print off who's been to the sessions that week. Have they done two sessions or three sessions or none? If they've done none, we're like, boom, Jane, you haven't done any sessions this week. Is everything all right? Like most gyms don't do that. I'm not saying that no gyms do that. I'm just saying that it could be two, three, four weeks before, oh, they're still paying the membership. Don't matter. Well, you know what I mean? And then yeah. you get a payment cancellation and then suddenly they're on the phone. Yeah. Like that's not what you should be doing. Like you're here to all these people. They're paying. If they're not here that week or they miss a session and they, they recurrently hit their sessions, you're on that phone. Boom, yeah. Jane, you missed a session this morning. It's ISA. Are you all right? You've not slipped. You're not banging your head. Everything all right? Yeah, cool. I'm all right. I just got up late. Cool. Job done. So you, you just you just know where everybody is and what they're doing. Um, but yeah, tangent again. Challenge. Uh, <laughs> it's just it's just a real simple approach that just keeps yeah. people accountable. Yeah. And then we so, have a, I mean the. the so, so it's not necessarily say a physical challenge. Like sometimes I, I've I've run in the past something like um, like a push up challenge this month. So like everyone's got their programs, but this month as an extra, we're gonna have like a push up. Let's see between all fifty of us, can we do ten, twenty, thirty thousand push ups? Whatever it works out at. And I put like a board up, and I'll have like a, a handicap system whereby if you can do a full push up you get one rep for every rep you do. If you're having to do your push-ups with your hands on a bench, you get a half half a rep for every one that you do or something. So so everyone's on a sort of relative even even keel. And just it, just to I've used it before almost as like a skill acquisition to say, right, well let's nail this for this month and then we'll all be better at push-ups. And then next month it might be, can you do an extra kilometer on the ski erg every time you come in or something like that but obviously when you're when you're operating online you're talking about more accountability can you attend more often can you um can you make your workouts more effective uh, and do all of the things that we're asking you to do rather than like a specific physical challenge would that be fair to say yeah i mean we already do that anyway i kind of miss i misread your, your question i think that's where i'm going with that one so that's right we we've, we've grouped them into teams of, of six right and then in those teams of six we only have the odd one or two client that wants to 
physically build muscle only. The rest of them have some body compositional changes to make. So yeah. we've set it up that the, the groups of six, the most weight that they lose as a group, win a prize. Yeah. The best transformation out of everyone gets 100 pound prize. So last, last time we did a lockdown challenge like this, we had a 100 pound prize, 50 pound prize and a 25 pound prize. And then everybody that got involved got a little prize each. So yeah. this time we've done it as like, right, everyone's going to get a free training session. So everybody that gets involved uploads the photos, uploads their beginning weight, puts their photos in each week as well as their weight so we can track where things are going. We'll get a prize for taking part, which is 98% of his client base is taking part. Yeah. Then we've got the teams. So for the, for the team that loses the most amount of weight, they will get a prize for six people. And then the person out of everyone that gets the best transformation in terms of not just how they look, but other things going off around them, session attendance, MEPS, uh, body composition, you know, whatever else we, you, they might tick them boxes that we've got on this form. So that's, that's how we look at it. So it's, it's a group challenge. Mm. It's more accountability too, but if I'm honest, we provide that level of accountability anyway. So not yeah. that, none of that's changed. What we're trying to do is we're trying to stop people from not attending sessions because what we've found before is especially in first lockdown people dropped off for three to four weeks because it's a bit of a mind blow isn't it you know mm. the, you start working from home which has never happened before then you can't go to your gym that you love you can't see yeah. the people that you want to be surrounded by so if we noticed in the first lockdown we had a lot to learn in terms of keeping people accountable online but then as we move through we feel we've nailed it. So yeah, it's the main thing is just keeping people on track with the sessions, making sure that they're continually in their targets and their goals and moving forward rather than backwards. Cool. Nice. Um, so just simple, lastly, but effective. The, you what? Sorry. Simple, but effective. Well, the, I mean, that's, I feel like I'm banging that drum every week when we record these podcasts and we've, Phil, Phil's been on, Emma's been on, Rachel France has been on, Ben's been on, uh, James Smith's been on, and everything that all of them has said has been simple but effective. And I, like, I, the, the, there seems to be this kind of myth that there's like a holy grail of personal training out there somewhere, and it's really fucking complex, and I need to just keep working, increasing my complexity, and eventually I'll get there. But everybody who we speak to is just banging home this point of, of simple and effective. Yeah, I think the best way to look at it is like painting a car. So you paint a car, you blow one shitty lit coat of paint on, you know it's going to come off and you're going to have to keep doing it. But the more you layer this paint, the more you do that to a, a level of professionalism, the better the paint job looks at the end of it. Hmm. And that's what it's to do. It's to do with layering this consistency day in, day out, doing the basics, doing them well, and not trying to find some magic formula or solution that's just going to, you know, magically come out of the air that nobody's thought about. Training is training. Movement patterns and planes and movement patterns and planes. They have to be adapted for that individual based off injury, weight, and a number of the factors. But movement patterns and planes are movement patterns and planes. Hmm. Right? You can, you can teach, it, teach it to a monkey. Yes, to, to a degree, yeah, for sure. Um, and then nutrition. Nutrition is a little bit different because the delivery of it and how people understand it and the level that you format it and apply it to can be a little bit different in some respects. But food is food. Protein is protein. Whether somebody likes chicken and don't like beef or whether somebody likes beef and don't like chicken, there might be a different fat content in that food, but it's still protein, mm -hmm. right? So the, the basics still apply. A calorie deficit is still a calorie deficit. The way that somebody does it, whether they do it through keto, intermittent fasting, increasing their energy expenditure, 5-2 diet, you know, not eating for two days and then eating for, you know, well, 5-2 diet, but flexible dieting. There's many ways to bring nutrition into play. It's finding what's right for that individual. And mm -hmm. people will, like, all the time you see it in keto groups and stuff like that, keto is the only way to lose weight. No, it might mean that you lose weight because you're cutting one macronutrient out of your diet, but it's an horrific fucking ride for the first four to five days to get into keto. And it's like me traveling from where I live to Sheffield City Center in cold, icy weather, in a car with the heat is on, 
or going round the tops on a fucking bike in an nappy. You know, I'm still going to get there, but it's not going to be pleasing to do it on a nappy on a push bike. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> a, li a little bit of um, South Yorkshire slang in there <laughs> for. Uh... <laughs> Um, mate, so last little last little line of questioning before we move into to the the end the end bit. So when I asked you at the very beginning in the not so quick quick fire round, I asked about how long it took you to qualify, and you said six months, not long. Um, and then when I asked you what you had sort of. Um, what you had learned from the course it was sort of a, you, you said that it was nothing substantial and that the the best thing you could do you the thing that you use most from your um your initial training is using your folder as a as a doorstop or a door wedge so what do you think sort of needs to change in terms of let's say if we could wave wave a magic wand and change the the education system for new PTs entering the industry from tomorrow onwards, what do you think would be a good place to start in terms of changing the, the, the structure or the topics of what they learn, what they don't learn? I think there probably needs to be, and this I'm, I'm pretty strong on, on when I say this, there needs to be a, a, a section of the course that is education formatted in terms of movement patterns how to program like how the body works cardio respiratory system all that kind of stuff that, that, they, that they cover but there also needs to be the delivery side of it too mm. so there needs to be some form of like if you were to do an apprenticeship yeah. like if you were to do an apprenticeship you learn and then you're in the job as well as applying it and i think that needs to be a staple part of personal training systems moving forward you learn all the right processes from the start assessing clients talking to clients learning clients programming for clients, movement patterns, when to regress and progress each exercise. So whether it's a squat pattern, a hip hinge, a vertical push, pull, whatever it is, they should know all that. And then they should be in the industry applying it before they're let loose on their own. So a type of an apprenticeship where you're not only learning, but you're starting to apply it under supervision in a gym. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, there's just no way I, I, we've all done it we've all done it and if i hadn't have done it I probably wouldn't be here now you probably wouldn't be the same we wouldn't have learned what we've learned and but some people will always invest to learn but other people don't have that that get up and go that drive to do that but that doesn't mean that they're bad coaches they just haven't got what's needed of them to yep. get to where they need to be and all these coaches that leave the industry are not necessarily bad coaches like they've probably had set off on the wrong foot. They've not had the support that they need. They've not had the cash back in to help them into investments like some coaches have. Like I didn't have any of that. I literally opened it, went and hired a community center and set a boot camp up and run around everybody that I knew. I've been training since 16 year old. I was well known for being fit, like having some muscle, like doing what I do. People used to come to me in the gym and ask me like certain exercises and I were never qualified but I knew to a degree what I was doing because from an early age, I'd invested all my time and passion into being a coach, mm -hmm. like not a coach back then, but into exercise, into training, into bodybuilding, into fitness, like fought for God knows how many years. So it were already part of me. Some people don't have that. Some people are forced, not forced into the industry, but have a journey into the industry because of an health issue or something else, which, Again, similar to me, but from an early age, I had that sporting background. Some people haven't got that. So it's very difficult for people to understand like energy systems and like all the basic movement patterns. So I think if there's, if there's a delivery system that brings people into education and then applies it in terms of an apprenticeship course where they're under the guidance of somebody inside a gym, like a joiner or a carpenter or, you know, anybody like that, I think that would start to make better coaches. It'd be more cost effective and they'd be getting some form of income while they're educating and learning rather than let loose on one of the most like on the body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be, which, to be which, is, which is probably the most complex piece of machinery on the planet. And we still don't know it. We still yeah. don't know everything about it. 
When um, I, uh, I was delivering at a conference in Dubai a few years ago, and I had a guy doing, um, doing a talk who was head of Fitness First out in the Middle East. Um, he's like an ex SAS guy, English, and, and he, he works high up in Fitness First out there. And he was talking about how if you want to work in the Apple shop, you have to do something like a 12 or 16 week probation period sort of um, mentorship to be able to learn how to turn someone's laptop on and off or to reboot it or, or whatever it is they do. Whereas if you want to be a PT, controlling the human body that is creating the, um, the technology, then you can be in charge of it within a couple of weeks with a piece of paper in your hand and then you're off on your own just doing doing what you want and he he sort of framed it in a way as to sort of make it sound ludicrous that other industries have things in place to ensure there's the um standards to the industry whereas whereas it's severely lacking in, in our industry although there are bodies in place that are working actively to 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 make it better yeah for sure. I mean, I, I could get a pair of pliers and pull your tooth out. I could be your dentist, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'd be able to do it. But the ramifications of that afterwards is going to fuck you up for a long time. You're probably going to get an infection. You're probably going to end up with two teeth missing rather than one. You're probably going to be <laughs> a bit of better looking than what you are now, to be fair. But <laughs> Difficult. Oh, I had to get that one in. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but you wouldn't, you, you, people wouldn't do that, would they? No. They won't go on a they won't go on a course for two to three weeks to be a dentist and then start extracting teeth. And I think yeah. although it's a bit extreme in terms of terminology, it's still a very similar thing. Yeah, no, it, it is. It's, it makes perfect sense. And uh, for, for me, you, uh, you you're preaching to the converted because because for me, I would love it if we could stop all um, all education tomorrow. Just stop it for like a month, and then during that month, introduce some sort of um some sort of internship or apprenticeship so that when you pass you almost have a 12 month window whereby you go to let's say take what some of the big chains that have got hundreds of sites throughout the country so there will be let's say if, you, if you've got three or four of those chains on board every single town in the country or within a 20 minute drive would have a site that 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 is participating in the program then if every single one of those sites had a pt within the site that gets paid 10 12 15 grand a year as a bonus by the company but their job is to mentor six eight ten pts that work below them so they operate as a self-employed pt within that site but they're sort of like a i don't know like a platinum level pt because they've proven that they've got x amount of skills and experience and they then mentor the people at the bottom who then just come through like a a tiered process you know like when um Let's say if your drains are blocked, you go on um, check a trader and then anybody who has got the correct qualifications, the correct insurances and very good feedback, they will pop up on the list and you then contact them to see who you want to come to unblock your, your drains. Whereas a system like that for personal training, where a personal trainer could almost have a live score based on are they insured do they have first aid um have they done enough cpd in the last 12 months have they um done a test this this year and they've what was their score that they got on a randomized test have we got feedback from some of their clients and it's tick these boxes or what have you and if anybody then takes their foot off the gas their score drops so if a client is then looking at two different pts your score is 87 out of 100 but mine's 43 well that tells you why i'm charging 15 quid and you're charging 200 pounds a week because you get what you pay for and i know it would be impossible um to implement short term but some sort of system like that i think would 
would massively transform the quality of the industry and i think more people would make more money as well it would it would make personal training a lot more um a lot more interesting to the client yeah for sure i think um, you've hit a few things a few nails on the head there i think the most important thing like the take away from all this though is that if you are if you're well learned you're educated and you've presented that you should have an opening and a gap in the industry like in terms of let's say for example a carpenter we mentioned it before join up they go to unit they go to college two three years mm. uh, they'll do a set amount of learning before they get placed on site and then they'll have to showcase that they're they're good enough to be a joiner right and that's the difference between somebody turning up and putting you a nice expensive door on and not ruining your door compared to just getting somebody out of a local paper to put your door on sabotaging your 200 pound oak door and then you're having to pay again yeah. and that's what happens in the industry people get coaches that whether it's by no fault of their own or whether it is by fault of their own we, we we're not here to judge that what we are what we do know is that people clients work with coaches they work with fitness professionals and i don't like using the word influencers or listen to them and then it's so hard to re-educate that client so hard to help that client because they've already been bitten yeah once you've been bitten you're sometimes twice shy luckily people still have a burning desire inside to change and get help and i've worked with many people who have been with three four five different coaches and it's like so hard to convince this individual that i can get them to where they need to be yeah. but i'm so confident in what i can do because i do it and i invest in it and I, I, I have the self-belief to get people from where i need to be but trying to get that across to somebody else if you're not 100 percent sure you can't get into where you want to be they won't be with you and you miss that gap then of working that individual, which means they could fall into the hands then of working with somebody else who's not as good, not as efficient, not going to help them. And then that could be the changing point for that client where they never, ever get to where they want to be, right? Or they never get the help they want to be. And that's sad. That is sad to see. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Agreed. Um, mate, on that note, we're going to move on and it is time to mass debate. It's been a while since me and you have mass debated together. Um, so it will be, this will, this will be a nice emotional return for me. Is that what you're going to use? That's what, yeah. Just so I don't, just you so might, I don't you might any, need, don't you, might need a bit of, you might need a bit of moisturizer or something to go with that. Yeah. It's been soaking in it all night. It's like all the night. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um because i like you i'm gonna fix this normally i do it um i do it genuinely but i'm gonna fix it and i've pulled out of the magic hat certifications because i think it's probably quite apt so what is going to happen from here i am going to argue for certifications and then you are going to tell me why they are a load of old tosh. Happy? Oh, right, all right. I think I know what, I think I get an idea of what, you, what we're doing. You might have to just break it down a little bit more because I'm a bit simple. Jesus Christ. <laughs> right. So even though I don't believe in it, I'm going to try and argue why certification shouldn't be. There you go. Yeah. Right, and you're right. gonna and you're gonna it's tongue in cheek, it's sarcastic, it's got it. flippant, and, got it. Got it. And, got it. Got it. and sometimes it's mildly amusing. Right, okay. But in this instance, the funniest bit will probably be you not understanding what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just I just didn't want to argue my case and everybody think that I actually meant it. No, no, that's right. Well, we, we'll add, we can add the caveats afterwards. But once I've got, once I've got the voice memo of you slaughtering certifications, um, then I'm going to use it to bribe you in the future. Happy days. Okay, right. Time to mass debate. The timer is running. So, certifications and qualifications within the fitness industry are absolutely crucial i would go so far as to say that they are non-negotiable after all why would you take your car 
to an unqualified person claiming to be a mechanic? Why would you invite someone to fix your boiler who doesn't know the first thing about plumbing or anything like that? It is ludicrous to think that somebody without a certification or without a qualification in a certain level can try to try to impart their lack of wisdom onto what is the most structurally complex piece of machinery on the planet, the human body. And even if you go through 10 years of information of education, then what you know about the human body is still a piss in the ocean compared to what there is to know. So anybody operating without a certification or a qualification should be banned from the industry forever because they give us a bad name. I went a little bit over, but Simon Herbert, please tell me why you think certifications are so terrible. Well, listen, I think certifications are terrible because if you can't read like me anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what piece of paper you've got. When you're good looking, you know what you're doing and you're as big headed as me, you don't, you, all you need to do is watch a five minute video on YouTube. That is going to get you through. Look, don't matter what a certification says. I know what I'm doing. I don't listen to anybody else telling me what to do, but I demand everybody else to listen to what I tell them to do because that's the way that this industry should be. Look, I've watched videos after videos for influencers eating chicken, broccoli and rice. That is the right thing to do. Fish and rice cakes for breakfast, mate. The most awful thing in the world, but we should do it because it's better for his health. So anyway, certifications are out for me. I know I can do my job because I'm better looking than most PTs. I've got more muscle. I've got better tattoos and I squat better because I spent half my life sat on the floor. Last three seconds, want to add anything? Uh, masturbate over. Masturbate over. Masturbate. That was, that was, I enjoyed that. That was. It was nice to watch you masturbate with such passion. You didn't see where my hands were, though, did you? No, I didn't. But I did notice that they were, they were like underneath the table quite a lot. Yeah. I've not known you to use both hands before. That's, um, what, have you had like an extension or something? No, I was sat on my other one. Oh, okay. <laughs> makes sense. Pins and needles makes it feel like someone else is doing it, doesn't it? That's it. Pins and needles, rubber glove and paint your fingernails. <laughs> um, right. Simon Herbert, now it is time for the section of the show which is called False, False, True. So, just in case you don't understand it, which is possible... I'm going to give you three statements and you tell me which one is the true statement. So the three statements I will give you are that I, at some point in the past, have pissed in my own face or I have spunked in my own mouth or I have shit in my own shoe. Right, me knowing you, they could all be very true. Could have, all happened, you sh- could have all happened in quick succession as well. I don't think you'll have pissed in your face because it won't reach that far. <laughs> but more of a dribbler. You only drink whiskey, so I don't think you've spunked in your mouth. <laughs> so I'm going to guess that you've shit in your shoe. As much as I would love that to be the right answer... You are incorrect. Oh, no, you're, I you're have, not mixing I, your own spunk with somebody else's, are you? Before we go on to question two, no, I listen. I have a rule when it comes to personal training, I will never ask anybody to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself. So, which one is the correct answer? It's got to be number one because you haven't got the rib posture to be able to get down and put your own spunk in your mouth. You're wrong again, mate. You're wrong <laughs> no, again. Off. No chance. Unless you're you've again. gone like that, unless you've gone like a scallop, there's no way you're getting it in your mouth. Handstand in the shower. Get away. Mate, we're talking 20 years ago. I'm not saying I'd, it's not my daily routine. It's not one of my non-negotiables. So, so it's not true then because it was shower water and spunk. No, fucking An accumulation no. of two liquids. 
Listen, it's my game. It's my game. Give me your three statements. Right. Three statements. I featured in eight adult movies between 2008 and 2012. Pornos. I once sat down at a nightclub table in Sheffield talking to two birds and they were rude and upset me that much that when they went to the toilet giggling, I ordered a 12 bottle of champagne and left it on their bill. Three, I once got a coach from Kent and Maidstone to Sheffield, but ended up waking up in Scotland. Oh, that is a good, that is a good selection. Um, and I think, I think, I think you've played the game very well here, and I think you've bent the truth a little bit. So, for example, on the porno one, I think you've probably been in like six pornos or it wasn't from 2008, 2012. It was like 1996 to 2000 or something like that. Um, I'm going to say no for the porno one, but I think there might be an element of, there might be an element of a gray area in there where there is some truth. Um, I, I definitely, definitely can see two girls getting very upset with you very quickly. Um, and would you have retaliated by ordering a very expensive bottle? Well, yeah, I definitely think you would. You're a little scallywag, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're a bastard. Um, you can take the boy out of Sheffield, but you can't take Sheffield out the boy. But I am going to go for the, I'm going to go for the, Oh, no, no, I'm going for the middle one. The coach trip one is a great one. I just don't think you would have slept for what would take about nine hours to get from Kent to Scotland. Um, so I'm going to go for the middle one being true. Yep, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, you got to elaborate a little bit. Any truth, any truth in the first one? Uh, possibly. And third one... <laughs> <laughs> Third one, I've, uh, I did fall asleep on a coach, but it weren't Scotland that I woke up in. It weren't past my hometown, though. Yeah, see, I knew there were... I see, you played the game well there. Worked them up before. Me and Natasha went to... Um, we went to Twickenham once to watch the, uh, the rugby final, and the next day we were flying out to Spain. So we had a holiday out near Gatwick, which is where we were flying from, and we got on the, we got on the train, we got on the tube at Twickenham, and we were so fucking pissed. We woke up in like East Ham, the opposite side of London, like um, the, the Olympic Park. And uh, we'd forgotten to get off at whatever station you get off to, to, to get the train down to Gatwick. And so we had, it took us about an hour and a half to get back to where we'd gone from. So it's easily done. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> easily done. Question asked only an hour ago, Ollie Jones. Any recommendations for pod type earphones that are good for doing videos where you are too far away from the camera for good sound? He says, obviously, I know Apple are good, but pretty pricey. I've only got Apple. So these are the AirPods. Um, yeah. Got noise cancellation on them. I'm definitely not going to sell Apple here, but these, are, these have been really good. If I'm filming from my iPhone, um, for, for anything Zoom related or calls or anything like that, or when I'm driving, these bad boys are always in. If I'm filming, I'll use a Bluetooth. Um, I'll show you. Bluetooth mic and voice receiver. Yep. And that is a Boyer. These are really good. So cool. like if I'm doing training videos that I'm uploading to an app or I'm doing any kind of sort of in the gym, um, where the camera is there and I'm doing a squat pattern or any kind of filming like that, I'll use the wireless receivers, uh, mm -hmm. little mic, lapel. And what did that set you back? Uh, I think they were about 60 quid, something okay, like so that. Okay, so very reasonable. 60 to 90 quid, yeah. If I'm doing um, any short, close work stuff, so like any upfront videos, then I'll probably use these, um, just because they're sim simply just easy to stick in. Uh, any voice calls or anything like that, Loom videos, Zoom, I was use these. Cool, nice. Um, the question that I alluded to earlier, Dave Scott says, I need some advice. I have flat feet, struggle when I run. 
It also hurts on shin splints and feels cramped up between my calf and ankle. Has anyone got any advice on how to sort this plus certain trainers to wear? I think that's going to go back to what we discussed earlier, isn't it? There's probably a little bit more going off there. Probably needs to see somebody who's biomechanics movement prep, like educated, uh, wants an assessment in place. So yeah, I'd probably um, refer that one out, I guess. Absolutely a bit more going correct, off. correct answer. Um, da -da 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 -da. I'll find one more. All right, a question asked by um, my co-host, Josh, who is bedridden at the minute, probably making the um, sequel to one of your pornos. Um, he, he asked a question yesterday, and this will be the last one. Do you have a contingency plan if this lockdown goes on for the next six, nine, or 12 months? Really good question. So... I'd have to scale the online stuff a little bit more. So bring my coaches in more of the online work, utilize them, help more people that way. But I think it all boils back down to two things. One, we need to figure out what the clients want, what they're happy to do, and how important those goals are for them to achieve. If they want to stay online, we might have to look at a price adaptation because we don't know what's going to happen for six to nine months. If we're online, we might have to charge a little bit less. We might have to change his marketing strategies in terms of bringing people on and marketing to people more online for online training. So we will adapt and overcome whatever is thrown at us. And I think that's one key trait as a good coach. It's no good sitting around and moping, moping around and feeling sorry for yourself. We work better when his back's against the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's how you've got to deal with stuff. Like, you you're never going to be you're never going to be uh secure and safe in anything that you do you could work a nine to five job for a company uh doing i don't know marketing ceo whatever be earning 100,000 pound a year that company might go bust over two nights you might not know about it you're still not secure mm -hmm. whichever job role you're in whatever you do you've got to adapt and overcome so yeah we'll uh, we'll adapt and overcome contingency plan we will we're predominantly running online anyway, so we've transitioned into that really, really well. Like I said, we've been doing it for a long time. We just find out what the clients want. What do the clients yeah. want? What do they need? Well, let's deliver it. Yeah. I, I'm, for, for me, for me, the most important thing there is that level of flexibility. Um, and you, you said that's one of my little phrases that I like using, adapt and overcome, uh, sidestepping obstacles, taking a step back to move three forward, however you want to phrase it. And there's, um, I, I, within about, probably, probably about halfway through the first lockdown, I, um, I had a, probably about five, six months where I, I barely even touched social media. I hardly spoke to anybody, just had time at home um, with the family and whatnot, re rebuilding and re sort of planning everything. Then when I started speaking to people in the industry, I remember saying, like, I, I think, I've got no way of knowing, but I think in 20, 30 years' time, when we look back at, at, at this 2021, 2020, I think it will be like a four or five-year period. Like when people look back at World War II, 39 to 45, or World War I was 1914 to 1918. Uh, I, I think this will be a a three, four, five year window, like the, the COVID years, as it were. So anybody who is just sitting there thinking, oh, Boris has said that lockdown's going to end in March and then a line's going to be drawn in the sand and I'm going to go back to doing 25 PT sessions face to face. Just get that out of your head right now because prepare for it to be fucking never to go back to a gym ever again. Because if you're prepared for that, then anything that happens in the contrary will be an absolute bonus. Do you, do you think? Yeah, 100%. I'm under no illusion that on February 15th, we're going to come out of lockdown. No. Like, no I'm under no illusion whatsoever. But providing all, our, all, all I'd be happy for, right, the business um, and the way that we adapt and overcome is, is down to us. What's not down to us is people getting out and socialising and having a little bit more clarity and getting out of their houses. Yeah. If anything needs to come out of February 15th, it's to let people that are struggling mentally 
back into society a little bit. Mm. We can we can control the coaching, we can control everything else. It's very difficult to help people that are, are on a declining path. And, yeah. and that's one thing that I want to come out of this lockdown for, for everybody, and not, not for us, but for, for everybody in general. But let me just add something else. <clears throat> I think if you to answer this question in terms of three, six, nine months contingency strategy plan, start delivering content if you're not doing so now on social media. Start delivering content to your future potential clients, mm -hmm. incorporating lockdown strategies, incorporating online coaching, incorporating everything that people start to become accustomed to it and start and see that that is a designated path that is doable. What you've got at the minute, and I have a lot of conversations with people, the conversations that we have, whether they're in the gym, whether they're online, whether they're to people that I know, whether they're to you about your clients and whatnot, people have got this blocker from going in a gym or to not training at all onto online initially. You also have the other end of the spectrum that are coaching from, uh, that, sorry, are working from home on Zoom meetings through work and have adapted and have just automatically took it into consideration that this is going to be the way forward. So how you speak to clients, how you put value out and how you sort of bend people's thoughts around what's right for them is important. So just by delivering shitloads of content around training online, strategies, lockdown protocols, all that kind of stuff, people start to see that. This is not something we're doing at the minute. We've, this is something we're gonna put into place, creating a content plan um, and putting loads and loads of content out and getting some engaging content going again. And the reason we've not done that is because we've always focused on the clients that we've got because they mean everything to us. Mm -hmm. But once we've got these clients sorted, they're up and, and going through this lockdown, then we'll start and focus on other people. Oh, that makes sense. Makes absolute sense. And I think that's probably the perfect note for us to finish on. Um, mate, I very much appreciate your time. Like we've been going back and forth for weeks trying to get this in. So obviously you're very busy and we've been busy our end and then with lockdowns and whatnot, a sort of um change things so we've had to we've had to adapt and overcome but i'm glad i finally pinned you down and there is there's, there's a huge amount of useful information in there so i'm sure once i exhaust my list of um potential guests and when people get sick and tired of coming on we'll have you back on again for um for a little bit of a simon herbert 2.0 in uh, later on in the year sounds good thanks for having me I hope everybody's problem, got some mate. valuable content from it. Of course. And if you can send us some of those YouPorn links, we'll, um, we'll put them in the show notes. I'm hoping they're still not around. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for today's show. Don't forget to check back weekly for new episodes. If you want to join the UK's largest Facebook group for personal trainers, just search for UK PTs.